audience participation. This is why we come to events. I don't know, sorry, I'm exhausted. My name is Ken Chen. Um, how are you all doing tonight? Thank you. Um, I'm a writer, and I'm here to moderate these three fantastic writers. Um, I'll say a few boring things, and then they will say enlightening, amazing, brilliant things. Um, so we're going to hear for Ingrid Rojas Contreras, Sophia Sinclair, and Philip Lopate. Let's give them all a hand. Before we start, I want to thank the Brooklyn Book Festival for, for organizing this. And I want to thank the Brooklyn Public Library. How many of you have a library card at the Brooklyn Public Library? Wow, like everyone. OK, donate to them. And also, go to their website, where they have lots of fantastic free events like this one, um, Brooklyn Public Library Presents. Um, and also, I wanted to thank all of you for lasting the grueling marathon that is the Brooklyn Book Festival and still being here at 5 PM. Um, OK, so we're gonna, they're each going to do very abbreviated readings. Then we will have our Oprah book club section, where Oprah is unfortunately replaced by me. And then you will have the point to ask questions and answers. But first, we'll do readings. Um, so first, I'm delighted to introduce Ingrid Rojas Contreras, the author of The Magnificent The Man Who Could Move Clouds, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle. And not only that, but Ingrid was recently involved in a movement to open the Pulitzer to undocumented writers. The Man Who Could Move Clouds is a book that feels like it was written by a mirror. A mirror is a device of reflection, which is the mode of the memoir. It is also the vehicle of signification, the way a mother can duplicate a daughter the way sympathetic magic can cause an effect on something, on something else. And it is also the tool of metaphor. This is a book about the void, the lack that is the deceased, the colonial past, repression, and the lack that is an amnesia that both she and her mother suffered years apart. The book is about coranderos, those who can generate ghost clones of themselves, speak to ghosts, and move clouds with their minds, like her grandfather, Nono, and her mother, Mami. Like Maxine Hong Kingston's The Woman Warrior, this is a memoir that operates between truth and fiction and shows how those categories might not be opposites. It is a book between a mother and a daughter, between what can be spoken and what is the unconscious. It is a book that is about the memoir, but pushed to such limits a memory that the memoir becomes science fiction. Magic as a way to will against colonial ways of understanding the world. Let's give Ingrid a hand. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read from the, from the fr first page. They say the accident that left me with temporary amnesia is my inheritance. No house or piece of land or chest of letters, just a few weeks of oblivion. Mummy had temporary amnesia as well, except where she was eight years old, I was 23. Where she fell down an empty well, I crashed my bicycle into an opening car door. Where she nearly bled to death in Ocaña, Colombia, in darkness, 30 feet below the earth, I got to my feet seemingly unharmed and wandered around Chicago on a sunny winter afternoon. Where she didn't know who she was for eight months, I couldn't remember who I was for eight weeks. They say the amnesias were a door to gifts we were supposed to have, which Mami's father, Nono, neglected to pass. Nono was a curandero. His gifts were instructions for talking to the dead, telling the future, healing the ill, and moving the clouds. Thank you. Oh, sure. I thought we were doing um, shorter, but I guess I will do more. <laughs> uh, we were around people, mestizo. European men had arrived on the continent and violated indigenous women, and that was our origin, neither native nor Spanish, but a wound. We called the gifts secrets. In the mountains of Santander, the fathers had passed the secrets to the sons, who passed the secrets to the sons, who passed the secrets to the sons. 
But none of his sons, Nono said, had the testículos required to be a real curandero. Only mami, strong-willed, unafraid, more of a man than most men in his eyes, whom he liked to call mi animal de monte, could have housed the gifts. But mami was a woman, and such things were forbidden. If a woman came to possess the secrets, it was said that misfortune would soon follow. Yet as eight-year-old mami recovered from, from her injuries after falling down the well, and as her memories returned, it so happened that from wherever her mind had gone, she brought back the ability to see ghosts and hear disembodied voices. The family says Mami was destined for the secrets, and since Nono couldn't teach them to her, the secrets had come directly to her. Four decades later, when I suffered my accident and lost my memory, the family was thrilled. Diaz poured drinks, told one another with an air of festivity, there it goes again, the snake biting its own tail. And then they waited to see how exactly the secrets would manifest in me. Thank you. So Sophia's book, How to Say Babylon, is coming out right now. And it has one thing I've never seen in a hardcover book, which is if you look at the inner leaf, there's this poem, Silver, beautifully printed. And it begins with the line, silver flows through my veins, the words I bleed are silver. And this line gives a sense of the power of this book, the way that blood can serve as silver, the way that wounds can serve as a form of sublimation. If you've read her poetry book, Cannibal, then you might have been struck by the way her sensuosity, her language, seems to surround a negative space. This book almost feels like the opposite. We finally know what was unspoken, what was that wound that could not be described. This incredibly moving, propulsive memoir describes a childhood living under an oppressive, patriarchal, Rastafarian family in Jamaica, in deeply impoverished circumstances. This is a feminist story of escaping male oppression through the power of poetry. And this will sound very cheesy, but as a poet who sometimes is an apostate of poetry myself, this is a book that will make you believe in poetry. Um, and I actually wrote that down three times, so, which means I thought I had a lot more to say. But it is an incredibly moving, rich, propulsive book, um, novelistic, and filled with uh, incredible texture of imagination that goes beyond memory into something like poetry in the novel. Let's give a hand to Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, happy to be here also with Ingrid and Philip. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Mommy, can you hear me? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, so I'm going to read a short, uh, just like a short paragraph from the book. Um, but I just want to clarify that the poem that's in the end pages in the book, I wrote when I was 16. So. Be easy on it when you read it, 60. <laughs> but it's important. It's with in, important in the narrative. Narrative, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so as Ken said, I, you know, I grew up in this very strict Rastafari household. Um, and by the time I was nine years old, I began to question these patriarchal rules, why they were different for me than they were for my brother. You know, my sisters, my mother and I, we had like these um, rules on what we could wear. We had to cover our arms and our legs. We had to cover our hair. Um, we could not wear jewelry or makeup. Our bodies were supposed to be pure. They were supposed to be the temple of Jah, which is the godhead figure of Rastafari. And so um, this passage I'm reading is, I'm beginning to question at nine what this is all about and whether I will whether this was the path for me. I came to realize that what my father wanted on his return from Japan was the perfect daughter. And when a Rasta man said daughter, he meant both his wife and his child, as my father called my mother his daughter when speaking to his Rasta brethren, who also called their partners their daughters. For the men of Rastafari, the perfect daughter was everything a woman was supposed to be. The perfect daughter was whittled from Jah's mighty oak, cultivating her holy silence. She spoke only when spoken to. 
The perfect daughter was humble and had no care for vanity. She had no needs, yet nursed the needs of others, breastfeeding an army of jazz mighty warriors. The perfect daughter sat under the apple shade and waited to be called, her mind empty and emptying. She followed no God but her father until he was replaced with her husband. The perfect daughter was nothing but a vessel for the man's seed, unblemished clay waiting for Jah's fingerprint. You're old enough now to help out in the kitchen, my father told me one day, making quick work of whittling me. That I need to learn from your mother. Watch how she carries herself. I watched my mother and found in her long silences something potent waiting to be said, like the anxious moment before thunder. But no matter how much I longed for it, she never thundered. She never spoke her mind or disagreed with my father. She smoked and breastfed my sister Shari. She smoked and spared me from the tedium of kitchen work. And she smoked and woke up before dawn to cook all our meals and hand wash all our clothes, folding them away afterward, like her thoughts in the back of the chest of drawers, untouched. She was the perfect daughter. Perhaps it was true what my father said, that I lacked discipline, the way any nine-year-old lacks discipline. I didn't always listen. I was skeptical. I was curious. I touched the flame simply because it was burning. Because discipline always seemed to me the pin that held the butterfly in its display case. Work maketh the man. Day after day, I swung over those words and saw ahead of me a life withering slowly under his multiplying decrees. Day after day, my heart bucked up against it. I was never going to be the perfect daughter. A grin of mischief opened ever so slightly inside of me. A seedling of a voice that said, no. Thank you. I just want to contextualize that my, my mother is now no longer silent. So good for that. I, I was saying earlier, I, I'm a little starstruck by <laughs> Sophia's mother being here because it's like the main character of an amazing novel walking off the pages and you're like, and being like, hey, what's up? <laughs> um, I'm also glad to celebrate Philip Lopate's A Year and a Day. If, like me and many of you being New Yorkers have spent a lot of your time being in the cultural fabric of New York by hearing Philip on the radio or reading his reviews or seeing him about town, um, this book is an experiment in that it's a collection of blog entries that he wrote over a year. And I was recently at a party where I met a young writer who was recounting a conversation she had with someone else where she said, this person wasn't even familiar with the early days of blogging in the 2015, 2020 period. And I never have felt more old in my life. Um, <laughs> which made me think that um, the blog in a way, like cinema, which is one of Philip's great loves, are, I feel like, two symbols of modernity that are already antiquated. Um, so what I think is so interesting about Philip's take on the blog form is that, uh, on the one hand, the book is breezily elegant. It's more occasional and impersonal than diary, but more porous and more personal than a critical essay. The book is very addictive. It reads more like a collection of ballet. But in this form, Philip can interrogate what is the form of the essay? What can we learn from people like Emerson and I think your great love, Montaigne? Uh, we read his thoughts on Kiristami, sh visiting Shanghai, urban planning, Gong Li, Catherine Deneuve, uh, his students, his wife, and much, much more. I felt like secretly this was an inadvertent memoir, a book about Eros, whether romantically through friendship or the intellectual eros that makes up this entire event. Let's give a hand to Philip. Thank you. Um, neither inadvertent nor advertent. I've never written a memoir. Uh, and maybe we can get into the reasons for that um, after, after this reading. Um, so uh, I wrote about a lot of different subjects. And one of them uh, was on the death of friendship. 
and I'm going to read the opening of that. There are few things as mystifying and unnerving to me as the demise of a friendship. I find myself brooding about the few friendships of mine that have cooled and wondering what went wrong. Was there something I did to offend? Some incident I can no longer remember? That would be the best case. Usually they dwindled away without specific provocation. We assume that love affairs are transitory, dependent as they are on the novelty of erotic excitement that habituates in time. But since friendship cools on a milder, steadier flame, it would seem that barring some unexpected quarrel, one should be able to save friends for life. The mistake here is in underestimating the romantic side of friendship, which can exceed that aspect in love affairs. Without the benefit of carnal release, there is no ceiling to idealization of the other or projections of spiritual attachment. The friend can seem like your psychic twin, the one you can tell everything to. This mirroring fantasy, essentially narcissistic, may shatter upon the discovery that the other person is indeed a separate individual with certain peeves that include you or monomania, monomanias that annoy you or periods of monastic withdrawal into self-absorption or simply ambitions to travel in a higher social circle than the one you inhabit. Thank you, Philip. So, um, one thing I was thinking about um, in my many attempts to devise ways of connecting all of your books um, is the way that writing a memoir or even writing a blog post, it's obviously very different from writing a poem or writing in your diary. In one way is that you're writing about other people and you're transforming your family members or your friends into characters and they become characters in different ways. Um, they can be very thick characters or flat or round, you know, people who appear in scene. Um, so in both of your books, your family members become these very vibrant characters um, in, in very rich and complicated ways. Um, there's the classic question that every young writer has, which is, can I say something mean about my mom or dad? Um, there's a little bit of that question. Um, but you're often, for example, imagining moments where you were not there, but you're depicting it in scene. You're deciding how do you depict your, um, your grandfather, your mother, your sibling in, in, as a novelistic character. And in your case, you know, your, your mother and father are particularly charged. Your siblings are going through the same thing, and there's very complex relationships. Um, so I'm wondering what you were thinking about in the process of turning them into characters. What, and how did they react? And Philip, I feel like the passage you read was so perfect because one current in your book is, uh, it seems like a meditation on the nature of friendship, uh, which as you say is different than romance. But your wife uh, pops up a lot. And I'm curious about how you thought about depicting her, how she felt about being depicted. And when you talk about your friends, there is this element where you talk about the erotics of friendship. And is there some element of homoerotic attraction there, which I thought was so interesting. Definitely. But I'd yeah. love to hear all of your thoughts on this. Um, I can start. I, yeah, I, I think when, when I was uh, writing about family, one of the things that I think about is um, you know, not just, you know, beyond like the person and what happened, I start to think about their, maybe like their role and what are the orbits of, um, you know, relationships that go out and make meaning. And so, you know, for my, for my mother, she was a curandera and she had like um, uh, a business running out of our house. Um, and she, you know, she grew up with my grandfather doing the same, but in a village. And, you know, I just, I watched her receive so many people um, from the capital in Bogota who would come to her with very specific crises. 
and you know she would be the person who is who is who is mediating that crisis and so to me that was really interesting and then i you know think about her and you know the uh, her as a character and like the complexities and the contradictions that live within her um and you know same, same goes with my dad and um you know this idea of um you know, abuse and like, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you kind of portray abuse if it's abuse in your family? Um, and yeah, I always kind of think beyond, like there's, it's important because, you know, we often keep so much silence ar around abuse because we want to be polite. Um, and it's, it's so important to break silence when that silence is protecting abuse. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, th I thought about, um, I, you know, I, I weighed all of those things together as I was crafting them on the page and trying to to think about um, not just what they mean in my life, but what they mean in the world. Um, I don't know if I thought this through when I brought my mom <laughs> because now I'm like, <laughs> I have to like talk about it, but not look at her, okay. Um, you know, I really wanted to have the book read like a, a tribute to the love I have for my siblings and for my mother and for my family. Um, and so, you know, similarly to what Ingrid said, not just like this is what happened and here are the facts, but I wanted, um, I wanted how I described everybody to hold some weight that the reader would feel skin close, that they would kind of feel, like you say, like you know these people, like you would feel the warmth of my mother's hands, you would kind of hear her laughter, that you would, you know, There's you There's a would... lot of love in your writing, I feel like. Thank you. Um, so that was important to me. Um, but then there were, some, there were some early chapters where I really wanted to get into the memories of my parents themselves. Um, and so I sat them down and I asked them, like I interviewed them extensively about their own childhood and their own adolescence so I could kind of craft that chapter about how they came to choose Rastafari when they were teenagers. And so that was really interesting to me because for the first time I had to hear, hear my parents kind of contextualize their own adolescence in a way that I'd never thought about it before. And so in the writing of the book, I came to know them in this new way. And then having to kind of sit inside their head as I'm writing the chapter um, really showed me, like I, I had to see them in a different light and, and a new love bloomed from writing them that way. Yeah. So I just want to clarify that in the past, um, I've written many times uh, about my family um, and uh, at one point, uh, my mother said, uh, that's it, you don't have the right to, I don't want you to ever to write about me again. And I said, but mom, I, I can do you, you know? <laughs> like, you know, you, you, you come alive on the page. I'm not going to say that. But she said, well, I'll go to your book party, but I'm going to tell the people that you are my nephew, not my son. Um, and she also said, why do you keep writing about that period? I said, you mean my childhood? <laughs> um, uh, in the new book, uh, my wife said, it was very simple. My wife said, uh, you, you may not write about me, you may not write about me, period. And of course I did. So, um, so and, and, and my daughter was a little bit the same way, but they both said, uh, they were both um, terrified when this book came out um, because I hadn't uh, let them read, read it in advance. I thought, this is my book, you know, and um, I want to have my say. So eventually they did read it. They said, well, it's not so bad, you know. <laughs> they saw there was a lot of love in it. Um, I just would like to clarify something, um, uh, why I've never written a memoir. Um, I guess if you were to add up all my, my personal essays, it would be a kind of a, a memoir in spite of itself. But um, a writer I know, uh, Emily Fox Gordon, said one problem with the memoir is that uh, it moves toward a redemptive or a, a transcendent kind of conclusion. 
you know, no matter how uh, screwed up the situation is, just the fact that this person wrote this book and survived is a kind of a triumph, a triumphalist, uh, uh, you might say, bias in the memoir. And um, me, I've always been very uh, leery of transcendence and redemption, so uh, I opted for the shorter form, uh, the essay, uh, which is more about, for me, it's more about daily life than it is about uh, transcendence. Um, I was debating if we should brawl over the, the, the nature of the <laughs> memoir, but maybe that's not a good idea. Um, but, um, but I'm curious, so you wrote about your wife when she said no. Yes. Um, and you interviewed your parents, which I think is so interesting, given especially your father, who, yeah. who's in some ways the villain. Um, no, don't say that. But, but I was so <laughs> impressed by how um, empathetic you are to your father and, and, and how things change in the end. So I don't mean that in a yeah, flattening yeah, yeah. way. No, I know what you mean, yeah. Um, but you know, when I, I first started thinking about writing it like maybe 11 years ago, and I felt that the book I would have written then and the way I would have written it is a completely different book. Like it, it was a book that wouldn't have been as nuanced and forgiving. More adversarial. Yeah. Um, because there, I would I would have been still writing out of wounds that were very fresh, and that ha I hadn't had enough distance. Um, and it was through doing these interviews and having to really sit in my father's head and his thinking and and thinking about his own childhood and his own childhood traumas, things that he'd never told me before. Seeing him get emotional about talking about his own childhood, um, you know, his his mother abandoned him because he became a Rastafari. And so when you described that scene to me, I was so moved in a way that I'd never had been before because he loomed so large in our house as like, you know, the authoritarian figure my whole life that I'd never had a chance to humanize him or he'd never humanized himself to us. And But in writing the book, I had to, you know, and it was important to me that I did, that, that I did ex you know, that I was able to um, portray everybody in all their complexities, good and bad. Um, yeah, so um, that was only possible after a lot of time, distance, <laughs> processing, um, to be able to write that way. Um, and in writing the book, I actually became a forgiving person, which I would have never described myself as before. But in writing the book, I kind of found it as an act of forgiveness, that the book itself might be a currency for healing. Yeah. Um, Philip or Ingrid, I wonder, um, when you were writing about your mother, she, she is this larger-than-life Marquez anti-hero almost, um, you know, like this charismatic, almost, I, I hope this is not a bad thing to say, like Bugs Bunny always <laughs> tripping up the, <laughs> the evil Elmer Fudds of the... the Colombian uh, <laughs> FARC versus state, terrible world. Sorry, this <laughs> metaphor kind of ran away from me. But did, did your mother read it? I feel like there, she shifts in terms of her density. There are moments where she's more mythic and moments where she's more like quotidian mother. Um, and Philip, in your case, you know, in addition to writing about your wife, you write about your daughter and your friends and um, doctors that you've had. Uh, you know, the person letting you into the waiting room. Uh, so did have people commented on how they're portrayed? Especially because I feel like because a blog is a quotidian form, there is this way where you can see yourself next week and then wonder if you're going to be in the next installment the following week, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they say that, uh, you know, if you go to sleep with dogs, you wake up with fleas, you know? And it's a little bit like if you hang out with writers, you know? You're going to be written about. Get used to it. I mean, a lot of, I mean, a lot of writers try to deal with the, the guilt that they have, you know, uh, in different ways. Like they'll they'll show they'll show the manuscript to their friend, you know, um, or or their parents, you know. Um, I don't want to give uh, the subject of money about that power over me, you know, so I don't show it to them um, in advance. I mean, my approach is just to accept the guilt, you know, like okay. <laughs> 
to a certain This extent, is really profound, actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm, t I'm a rotten individual. You know, I'm going to hurt people sometimes, you know. Uh, they're going to hurt me too, so let them write their book. Um, that sounds I, like the same conscientious process that you went through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm lucky because my, my mother doesn't like reading, so she's never read anything that, that I've written. And she, what she'll say is, oh, if they turn it into a movie, I'll watch it, though. <laughs> um, but what we do is that I, um, I usually tell her, as I'm writing, I usually tell her what I'm thinking about. So I'll say, you know, you told me this story in it, um, and I'll just tell it back to her and it, to say, like, this is what I got from what you told me. And, and I'll tell her, like, I'll, I interpret it this way, or I'm, I'm thinking about this connection and how you are. And then she will, sometimes she will disagree with me. And I put that all back into the writing. So I, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to, to, you know, to write her character, I, you know, I think about those moments where she, she is kind of behaving very mythically. Like, you know, people are coming to our, to our home and she's like praying over water and giving, you know, giving that water to them and saying like, this is gonna, you know, heal your broken heart. And, you know, people are, you know, coming back and coming back for that. And then she, you know, she, she can't, you know, she doesn't know how to like make rice, for example. Um, and, you know, and so thinking about her and, you know, in those ways, um, and there's just so much humor t to her too. Um, but, but in writing it down, I put both, you know, what, what I interpret as the truth and then her, the, the little things that she says to argue with me, you know, she'll say like, oh, she I don't, you know, she says like, I don't, you know, I don't believe that that happened that way or that is, that isn't how I felt. Um, so I don't interpret those comments as I'm supposed to correct what I write down, but I interpret it as I'm going to, you know, write the kind of the truth as I see it and how I interpret it and have a little moment where, where you know, I'll have like, you know, and my mother says like, sh she doesn't think that happened. And, and to me that, that feels like a, um, a closer approximation to, to truth than just, you know, trying to kind of choose one and that's the one that you tell. You mean to contest it instead of yeah. saying that there is a Yeah, truth. like the, the conflict, like the disagreement um, with it. I think that's, yeah, that's interesting and in that also, yeah, I think that's closer. I wanted to ask all three of you about world building um, because I feel like that's one thing that all three of you were doing in that there are often complex things that you're trying to have the reader understand. Um, I think sometimes when you're writing maybe out of a diaspora context, you have this entire world you need to understand. So it could be the world of your family. Um, who are all these personalities and characters? It could be what is the political situation? So, uh, you know, the history of the Spanish colonization, the Casta system, who is FARC? What are these guerrilla movements? Um, what is what what is this type of shamanism uh in your case you know not even what is jamaica but what are these different you know all the different flavors of rastafarianism um but also just the different places you're living the settings the the shore the school um and philip i feel like your book is about the world of new york culture and that we really i feel like we get a sense of what your typical day is like uh, where you like to hang out a little bit, what movies you're thinking about, um, where you um, go when you're not in New York. Um, so there is this way where by focusing on the quotidian, you're painting this sense of what your cultural world is. And I feel like you, you, know, you must have had some sense of writing these blogs not as a series of essays where you're pitching ideas, but as being something slightly personal. And the two of you, I feel like it must have been very intentional to figure out how much, how am I going to teach the reader something without them having to get exposition slapped across their face? How much am I going to have that's not in standard English, um, but have some of that in there? So I feel like that is always an interesting experience as a writer. Um, so how were you navigating this well, world the building? Year, the year that I was writing about was a year that, um, that Trump got Trump. elected. And um, I, I wrote several... Um, entries about, about the election, about Hillary and about Trump. And um, uh, I'm always a little bit uh, 
um, hesitant uh, to write about politics uh, because uh, I want to be able to say something new, and so much has been said, you know, so much of it would come out like just the standard, you know, left-wing rant, you know? Uh, so, but, but obviously, uh, politics impinges on my life, you know, I can't help, uh, but I, I could not help but, um, you know, be thrown uh, by, uh, by Donald Trump, you know, uh, as many of us were, you know? Um, and um, actually, I had to tell my wife, I had to put her on a MSNBC diet because she was watching about uh, 12 hours a day, and I said, no, no, you know, like, that's, that's crazy, you know? Um, but so, so I had to do the same thing with myself. I had to, uh, to rigorously uh, say, I'm not going to brood about this more than two hours a day, you know? But those two hours, I couldn't escape. Um, well, you know, for me, I, going into this, there was so much about Jamaica and about Rastafari that I knew that I needed to expand. Um, expand the global view of what it is beyond this sort of postcard idea, someone else's idea of paradise. Um, Cause I, and, and also, particularly growing up Rastafari, I feel that even though it holds this really large space in the global and cultural imagination, most people don't really know, or what they think they know about Rastafari is not accurate. You know, like we're less than 1% of the Jamaican population. They're historically a persecuted minority in Jamaica. And, you know, the, the movement's beginning is entwined with British colonialism. Um, and so, it had to be political, right? But for me, writing is always a political act. The fact that I'm speaking to you in English is a political act. Um, but then also writing about Jamaica, being someone that comes from the seaside, who saw the hotels being built up on either side of my village, hotels that we were forbidden from going to, was something that I also wanted to express to the reader. Um, and like you say, in a way that wasn't just a fact dump. Yes. You know, as a poet, I, re I agonized over how do I interweave the history and the political and cultural context in the narrative and still have it read beautifully and like, you know, like enjoyable to read, right. that there's poetry there. So I was trying to do all of those things at once and I wanted the reader to also feel my love of the natural landscape of Jamaica, of my island and everything that I love there, to feel kind of immersed in the humid kiss of Jamaica. And so I, I was thinking about doing all of those things at once when thinking about world building. <laughs> I never thought about it as world building, but like how do I, you know, find a mirror from the landscape, a mirror for how I construct the actual sentences on the page. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, I think for me, I, I, I traveled back to, to Colombia, um, and I, I think I talked about history only when I had questions that I couldn't answer. Um, and one of them was that, you know, like the, in my family, and many curanderos are very secretive about what they do. And so that started for me as a question, like, why, what is the secrecy or where does that come from? And it, you know, it led me to the, to the history of, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, dragging curanderos from their communities and, you know, taking them to the pyres and people would be, um, you know, uh, they would die fr from that. And so then that was, that was like the moment that that sort of silence was, was born. Um, and in, in thinking about like the most interesting you know world building that I did in the memoir was probably in in there's a part where I'm talking about my mother's accident and her experience of amnesia and my accident and my experience of, of amnesia and I just remember just being constantly on the phone with my mother asking her like what do you remember of this time where you didn't have a memory um, and it was so complicated to write into that area because it's it's a it's an area where you're you're both um, 
like on the cusp of becoming and also being undone at the same time. Um, and it was just, I mean, it, it was so challenging, but it was so beautiful um, to write into it. And I, I wanted to kind of write like the, the surreality that we, you know, each of us felt during that time and the things that we, you know, that the, the parts of memory that we still had and kind of held on to and the way that things felt very strange and looked very strange. Um, that's probably the, the part of the book that I loved writing the most because it was so, it was so challenging and so difficult, but so satisfying. And I remember I was, I was writing that part um, one sentence um, a day because hmm. it, it was just so, wow. you know, I would have to think about, okay, so like in this moment, in the scene, I don't remember anything, but how do I describe the experience of, of being on the street? Like, how do you actually do that? And I could only do it one sentence at a time, and it would take me so long, and I, and I would just be done for the day. Wow. So that part took a long time to, to write. We, we might have time for one question, but I might ask a question in case no one... You're all introverted. That's why you're here. Okay. So all three of your books, they are, have one thing in common, which is that they're all about the power of culture, books, poems, narration you know, poetry as a way to escape narration. Like, uh, shamanism is really storytelling, you know? Uh, and, you know, your reviews are clearly all about the life of the mind. But I want to flip it and say, I feel like at the same time, all three books of yours are about dissociation. And you have your inside and your outside, what, what you look like, you know, like the black dress uh, that you're getting when you fall, the dreads, how other people see you. Uh, but your inside is completely different. So, Phil, in your book, you're, there's a part where you talk about how you're good at friendship, but your wife and daughter say that you're always checked out and you're <laughs> in your head. And, you know, I feel like, you know, clearly having amnesia or having this alienated inner world because of your family and your school situation. I, my question is, do you think that dissociation is a laboratory that makes writers? Do you think writers have to be alienated and checked out? And, and what was it like to write about that? I think Which, a certain amount of detachment, I don't know if dissociation is the word I would use, a certain amount of detachment is a good thing to have as a writer. And it may, may not be so good in, in, within your family, um, your domestic situation, but um, when you come to write about something, you know, um, you don't want to write with an axe to grind, so it's good to have some detachment, you know. Um, and, and writers are strange creatures because they're always watching other people. They're like spies in a way, you know. Um, well, uh, it's not well known, but writers also envy non-writers because non-writers don't have to keep watching everything all the time. You know, uh, Henry James said, be someone on whom nothing is lost. Well, a non-writer doesn't have to take on that obligation at all. Anyway, I do think that, um, that um, I don't know if alienation is the right word, but, but uh, certainly ability to stand back um, and, and, um, and to be able to look at yourself also with some distance is really important. Um, I guess I'll say, yeah, I, I think that there was something really helpful about um, losing my memory. And I, I always say that it's the happiest that I've ever been. Um, and like the experience of not having a memory, it was just ecstasy, it was just joy. It was, everything was constantly new to me. Um, it, there was just like such a sense of curiosity. And I, from time to time, I still use that as a, as, as a sort of writing exercise or an imagination exercise where I would pretend that I am back in that state and that I don't have a memory. If I don't have, you know, the language on my fingertips and what would, how would I even kind of describe the speaker, for example, if, if the word speaker was not something that I had. Um, and yeah, I, I think that there's, especially in the process of remembering myself, um, you know, because I had that experience of seeing a reflection of myself in a black window and not even realizing that I was looking at myself for a few seconds. Um, there's something, yeah, very magical about kind of being stuck outside of yourself where you, you get like this 
uh, you know, multi-second moment where you can really see yourself as separate, like the, uh, you know. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I love that and I try to recreate that in myself all the time. I love that, that like joy that comes from <laughs> being unattached to memory. That's yeah. lovely. I wish I had that kind of. <laughs> yeah. I wish that there was a way that, you know, to, to give people amnesia in a very specific way yeah. where, you know, nothing else was impaired. You didn't lose yeah. language, but it was just you, you know. Yeah. So good. Constant, like, joys of discovery. Yeah. Um, for me, let's see. It, was, it wasn't, like, disillusionment or detachment. I, I think because I'm a poet, we're have, we have this, like, particular affliction, right? It's like once, you, once you've written your first poem or read your first poem and felt like the current of the poem moved through you, the damage has been done, you know? Um, but I always think of solitude or quiet as kind of necessary for poetry to happen. So yes. maybe, yeah, there is something in that idea of, um, for a long time, you know, when I was growing up, the solitude wasn't my choice, but it then became this sort of necessity or it pushed me toward poetry being my space of survival. Um, and so then the solitude which came from being isolated in the Jamaican society because I was Rastafari then became the thing that I nurtured and craved the more I grew up because that was the space where I began to see poetry happen. I began to feel what magics could move through the words on the page. Yeah. Do we, do we have time for questions from the... Audience? Do we, do we have any, can we do one question? Okay, question? Can we do one question? Are there questions? No. <laughs> We've explained everything so well that there were We've no presented questions. all of human knowledge. You know, I, I notice people being like, I have a story to tell you. Listen to this story. <laughs> this story. This is the next book. You know? <laughs> so it's like, Philip, how you were saying that we're always kind of listening and kind of like, you know, distilling the lives of, of each of other people into this potency. But now I know they're saying I'm ready for my close up. I'm ready for my close up. Like, are you listening? Let me tell you the story. <laughs> so I found that really interesting that people are now coming to me as like the storyteller of the family, but they want, they're like, they're trying to push me toward what they want me to write. Lobbying. About. Yeah. yeah. Lobbying. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just I was thinking about how earlier you said um, that shamanism is a you know uh, storytelling. I think you know storytelling can also be shamanism, yes. and you know and, and so of course you put you put a very personal story out there. People are moved by it, and they you know want to tell you like this is how this is what happened in my life when I when I read. And I always I welcome those, and I love hearing those stories. Um, you know, my family too does that now yeah. where they will either tell me or not tell me stories, yeah. but then other people will tell me the story that they don't want to tell yeah. me. And it's, it becomes this network of everyone's trying to manipulate mm -hmm. <laughs> the, exactly. the next work. Yeah. Uh, my aunt put in a request for who she wants to play her in the movie. Wow. So like it's that Who level. was it? Who was it? Halle Berry. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, the, the book I wrote before this is called A Mother's Tale, and it really um, was a story of my family. And um, uh, my one sister loved it and bought copies for everybody. The other sister said, it's all lies. Um, and, and my brother never finished it. Um, so there you go. That sounds like the family that would drive one to become a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, now that we've all processed our family dysfunction, so you don't have to, um, I want to say, uh, Philip, is your book out yet? The, the new one, the NYRB book? Yes. Okay, so all three books are for sale, and these beautiful people will be here to sign them and uh, for you to tell them their stories, who you should be in the movie. Yeah. Um, but sorry, let, let's give them a hand, Ingrid, Sophia, and Philip.